<laughs> okay, starting all over. We're delighted to have you um, who chose to were able to join us this afternoon. We have more people we hope will come on. Um, and just wanted to uh, tell you how proud that we are as a Tikkun Alum Committee um, that we have really been ahead of the curve, if you will, for the last couple of years that we have been working to build awareness, not just among our congregants, but also um, among people in the community at large, uh, to build awareness about key environmental issues, um, often bringing in people, talent and resources uh, from the broader community. Um, not just to enlighten and educate, but also to really uh, describe specific actions that individuals can take, groups they can join, um, all ways in which uh, any one of us and every one of us can have impact. Um, so this is a continuation of that effort. And we expect that with your engagement, we will have a very compelling and empowering event. Um, a, um, a fruitful 90 minutes, less 10. Um, and that we will first just spend the 20 minutes that we have um, paying attention to this book that was chosen uh, really almost two years ago by the Tikkun Olam Committee as what was then to be our book of the year selection. And um, we knew that it was an important book. It was groundbreaking in terms of being able to really uh, bring people's attention to what by then was called the, cri the climate crisis. And we wanted to use the example of this particular gifted, even revered author who happens to be a psychologist and who can translate um, often complex ideas and feelings into understandable terms and to show her own um, efforts as just a citizen, as an ordinary citizen, um, really taking on a major uh, environmental challenge in her state of Nebraska and starting what she called a citizen's rebellion. Um, so what I, I really would love to do is not to shame because um, there is no such uh, reason for that in our group, uh, but I, I would love to know who, just a show of hands or show of hands using the symbol in the um, participant screen or I think it's participants or in the chat. No, it's in the participant screen. Um, who has managed if you, to read the book and or at least to listen to the 19 minute TED talk? Okay, great. All right, so some of, some of us. Um, and again, no, no pressure, but as somebody, uh, I don't know if anybody's older than I am, but I actually remember uh, the first Earth Day. I was a freshman, I was 18 years old, freshman on campus uh, for the very first Earth Day in spring of 1970. And, you know, at 18 years old, I was generally aware of a lot of things being a child of the 60s, but um, don't think I was particularly aware of the environmental issues. And, you know, here we are 51 years later, and I am uh, I have been, you know, on the verge of apoplexy throughout that time, you know, very given to thinking, you know, this, uh, just as uh, Mary Pfeiffer explained, um, you know, are, are we doomed because of people's, whatever you want to call it, the apathy, greed of corporations, et cetera, et cetera, doomed to not take care of this beautiful planet that we live on. Um, and fortunately, because I hang with the right people, I guess, I have found, or I'm inquisitive enough to find, to have found out that there are, we were talking about this a little bit before, and then uh, actually in the book, that I don't I can't I have too many things underlined, but there is something like 2 million groups. There are lots and lots of groups that are working on behalf of the earth. So 
there is encouragement to be had. And, and as Mary Piper says, she, she also shows you the way to go from trauma to transcendence. Um, but, you know, you think about it, she was really clairvoyant. She wrote this, she started writing this book in 2010 and finished it in 2012. It was published in 2013. And when you read through, I reread re, I reread bunches of passages. What she was talking about then, here we are eight years later, what she wrote about was only more um, real today in terms of you know, people's responses, political climate, um, what has been undone in the last four years under uh, the former administration, you know, what the potential is now. Um, and I'm just curious whether any of you have done your own retrospective thinking, even on a very cursory level, um, to think about how your own thinking has changed, what influences have been brought to bear as you think about the issues facing our planet. Um, you know, I know I've owned my own denial um, or reluctance to get involved because it's such an overwhelming issue and how can one person make a difference? Um, so just because I want this to be interactive and before I have the pleasure at 4.30 of or sooner of introducing you to our guest today, anybody want to share about I, I know Marianne has a, has a particular story to tell, but anyone before we call on Marianne, who's a, a great role model for us, um, want to talk about, have you thought about the climate? Have you thought about these issues? Where do you stand? And as they say, don't all rush at once. Well, I, I certainly, I, go ahead, Howard. Howard, okay. thank you. Unmute. Howard, yeah, unmute, please, thank you. You know, you think after a year I'd figure this out, but you know, especially a techie guy. <laughs> thank you. Um, other than the fact that, that Earth Day started from Arbor Day, which started in Nebraska, and that's why it's uh, the 22nd, um, I am not terribly uh, optimistic about the future. Uh, I, I'm glad we have this current administration, but it just appears um, that the people who want to save the environment have got to change their arguments. And I would cite just one example in Kansas where some environmentalists came in and they said, well, you know, we have to save the environment. And they were kind of viewed as kind of these first off outsiders and, you know, God forbid socialists or something like that. But then a few years later, they, they came in and started going into the churches and said, you know, God gave us, you know, dominion over the earth for a reason, and that's to take care of the earth. And it was much more well received than those terms. So I think we really have to fashion our argument to the audiences if we're going to be successful about this. I'm just, I have to admit, pessimistic because I think people are just really selfish and they're not, I mean, the whole idea of this pandemic, wear a mask for somebody else. You know, so I know other people are more optimistic, so I will start off with the pessimistic, you can move to the optimistic. <laughs> no, fair enough. John Liu, what did you want to add? Well, I, I have no idea what the future will be. I'm not clairvoyant. Uh, however, um, I've always been concerned about the environment. Uh, and, and of course, reading and studying have learned much more. Uh, and and to the degree that I was really going to start to investing in Bitcoins until I started to research it. It is horrible, the amount of electricity that they use every mm -hmm. single day. I haven't seen very much written about that. And if we really are concerned about the earth, that has to be addressed. So I'm not buying them, <laughs> nor am I using them. Yeah. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. I'll have to read into that. I didn't know anything about that. Unbelievable. Amazing amount of energy. I saw something. I just saw a headline or something oh, yeah. in this last it's, week about... It's horrific. Yeah. yeah, I had no idea the degree. I started to read about it. 
Yeah, you think about coins, it's not something that- coins yeah, because I, I thought if, what the heck's his name, the, the Tesla guy. Oh, if he's, if he's, Yeah, right. If he's doing all these wonderful things for the earth, well, you know, creating such a, a different type of an automobile, certainly he's going to be investing in something, hopefully, that's better for the earth. Uh-huh. Nope. <laughs> Read rules. Marianne, I'm just wondering if you want to comment since you've taken a big step that you've always been involved or you've been involved, it seems, but more recently, only more involved. Uh, yeah, so recently I started, uh, I, well, uh, since last January, I started taking a class through Rutgers uh, to become an environmental steward. And it ends in June, and then I have to do 60 hours of an internship. Um, and then I'm expected to continue working in my community. So we've had um, just amazing, amazing experts from all over New Jersey. It's just been amazing. Um, and then the only thing I'll add is that Pope Francis and my husband, although I'm not equating my husband to Pope Francis, but um, they both think that it's that it's going to hit the poor the most, and the richer people will be able to probably largely adapt. So that's to me is very concerning. Um, and I just want to just an FYI, my dog has been cooped up all day. I'm outside. Um, I might have to leave for a minute, but I'll be back. Okay, nature calls. Thank you. It's great to have you. Okay. Well, um, I do urge anybody who hasn't listened to the TED Talk to do so, just because I think it, uh, again, it, it helps um, zero in on how those of us who might be reluctant to get more involved could think about it. And, um, and I'm hoping that from, <clears throat> or we're hoping the reason we, we um, have invited our guest is because we wanted to have a real live model of political and environmental, I should say, not political, um, activism in, the in our state of Pennsylvania in the form of Karen Ferridan, who I have called the force of nature because since Dara introduced her by name to me and by researching her, um, I was just, you know, blown away by how much this one individual has managed to do in taking on, um, and she'll tell you her story, but um, Karen uh, was known on, on, uh, by bio as the founder of the Pennsylvania-based anti-fracking organization, Burke's Gas Truth and the co-founder of the Better Path Coalition, a Pennsylvania coalition led by grassroots and frontline communities to forge a path to a clean, renewable energy future and a government that puts the best interests of Pennsylvanians over those of the oil and gas industry. She's a prolific writer and you can just Google her name and you'll find many of her articles online um, the one that I first read uh, was horrifying, and that was what it was like living through a pipeline explosion and what Pennsylvania's government should learn from it. Um, and before I give her um, the stage, um, I do want to highlight one thing that Mary Pfeiffer did say, that when they, when she invited neighbors and people in to have potlucks that became this coalition to fight the Keystone XL, or as they called it, the, the extra leaking pipeline. Um, she said, this is not a political matter. You know, water is not political. Water is either clean or dirty. It's not red water or blue water. And I think that's something that we should all keep in mind. So I am offering you, Mary, um, seven more minutes, gladly, and are eager to hear your story. And uh, we will have time for question and answers. I urge everybody to use the chat um, to start putting in your questions, and then we can get to them when it makes sense. I think. 
Karen will be sharing information that will no doubt provoke some other reactions and questions. So thank you, Karen. Well, thank you. I'm going to share my screen um, to talk over a few slides that I prepared for today. Really, they're just photographs, but not a whole lot of preparation. <laughs> I should say you're in the middle of a congressional uh, marathon, actually. So we're very honored to have Karen make time for us. Oh, well, thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, I think this is a long time in coming, actually. We were supposed to do this last year, I believe, and then the pandemic hit. So um, it would be wonderful to be able to be together in person, but I'm really grateful for Zoom because it has managed to keep us all connected throughout this very unusual period. I just want to make sure you can all see my screen. Okay, great. So um, I, I wanted to put this uh, cartoon on the very front because, uh, you know, there are, are two scientists who are looking at the pandemic and they're looking at the flattening of the curve that we used to talk about a year ago. <clears throat> and um, I read a, in Yale Climate Connections, I believe it was, a headline that said, uh, the pandemic is the quiz, um, climate change is the final exam. <laughs> and so, uh, and that's depicted here where you see that, you know, everybody's looking at this one issue and what's one massive problem and thinking that it's enormous, but, you know, the enormous problem is coming. And that's why uh, we all need to kind of learn from this past year and from everything that has gone on. And, uh, you know, somebody already brought up the reluctance to wear masks and, you know, who it is we're really dealing with, you know, who, who our fellow humans are to understand that it's not easy to fight these fights and to get everybody sort of on board. But um, I think there are a lot of things we can do. I'm not pessimistic at all, actually. Um, we're not going to be able to stop climate change. We can do a lot to mitigate what is already uh, starting to unfold. It doesn't have to get as bad as it could get, but there's some bad stuff in store. But I do have faith that we're going to make the changes that we need to, to at least mitigate the worst of it. Um, so I'll start by telling you a little bit by, about myself uh, and kind of leads up to the points that I want to make that relate back to the green boat and Dr. Piper's work. So I'm an unlikely environmentalist. Um, we had our Rachel Carson moment at Hawk Mountain when I was a kid. That's me there with my brother and our dog, Mickey. <laughs> um, but that's a rare photo of me being outside. I, I actually love the great indoors. <laughs> I'm allergic to everything and I have lousy feet. So I, I really don't like walking around much. <laughs> you know, I would actually rather take poison than go camping, quite frankly. <laughs> and, so, um, and so I'm not the kind of person that you would ever think of as being an environmentalist. So I show up all like, you know, fat and pasty. And I think some, in some ways that makes me more relatable because I'm not looking like I just stepped off of a trail, like a lot of people I know in the movement that I work with do. Um, so I just, I think that you don't need to be somebody who is out there loving nature and hiking and camping and doing all those great things um, to care about clean air and pure water and healthy soil and a livable climate. And so in that way, you know, I'm representing the same concerns that everybody should share. And when I'm able to talk about it that way, I find that people kind of uh, get past this idea that I think somebody already brought it up about activists and how we come across. I think if you just talk about it in a relatable way about you're just concerned about the health of future generations or ability to live on this planet and all that sort of thing, I think it, it's been kind of effective. So um, I did want to put a mention in about that because I thought that was a really good comment that already came up. Um, so like I said, I'm a very unlikely environmentalist. So as you can imagine, it was not on my list of goals for life to become one. Um, in fact, I kind of fell into it when I came back to Kutztown 13 years ago. I lived in Lehigh Valley for a long time, actually. But I moved back here uh, and bought a house. Friday was the 13th anniversary of my closing as a first time homeowner. And so um, as soon as I got as unpacked as I'll ever get, I think, um, I went to the Obama office and asked if I could uh, volunteer. And I made the mistake of saying that I had lots of time on my hands. Pro tip, never say that when you go to volunteer somewhere unless you're really ready to be immersed in something. 
Uh, I also said that, you know, maybe I could do some data entry or something. I was coming off of a very rough patch in my own life when I had had an illness that forced me to go on to disability and my parents got sick. They died within six months of each other. We were settling estates, emptying out the house. It was just one thing after the next for years. And so um, I kind of felt used up. I kind of felt like maybe I didn't have anything to contribute any longer. And I really felt removed from the rest of the world. I was so you know, insular for all those years, having to deal with my own life and my parents and everything that I just felt disconnected. So when I went to the office and said that thing about data entry, I thought, well, maybe this is me dipping my toe into life again. What I understood quickly when I got on the other side of it was that everybody shows up at the office saying they'd like to do some data entry. Um, nobody shows up saying, hey, I'm really into haranguing a bunch of people into going out in 95 degree weather and canvassing. Nobody volunteers for that job. And so when I, when I stepped into that role, um, they very quickly made me uh, the neighborhood team coordinator for Northern Brooks County. And so I really never thought that I had the chops for that. I went kicking and screaming into that role, thinking there was no way I was ever going to be able to do that. But as I started doing it, it turns out I had some organizing skills I didn't realize that I had. And I was having new experiences that I never thought I was going to have. So it was all very positive. And then the great thing was I started meeting new people that I didn't know about. I had come back here because I had so many friends in the area, but there were so many things happening around here and people that were doing incredible things that I just didn't know about before. And I was now meeting them. And so a number of them were involved in either environmental issues or renewable energy efforts. And I started getting involved with them. And that's sort of how I just sort of fell into it. My one friend, Dari Sicker, I don't know if you've ever heard of her, but she runs something called the United Sludge Free Alliance, which is a big deal in this area. This idea of using the residue from sewage treatment plants as a fertilizer in our food crops. Uh, and it goes on public lands. The National Mall is fertilized with it. Uh, it's used on uh, like golf courses and in some of the stadiums that have natural grass, you know, they use it as a fertilizer. So it's everywhere and it's nasty stuff. And so she wanted to start an organization. Um, she was having trouble getting it off the ground. So she asked me if I'd help her and I got involved with that organization. At the same time, I met a lot of people, Daria included, who are uh, part of the Mid-Atlantic Renewable Energy Association. And so I was asked to be on the board of Maria. Uh, the group still exists, but back when I was part of the board, we were organizing an energy fest every year in Kempton in Northern Brooks County, not so far from Hawk Mountain here. Um, and so we would have like this big event on the Friday evening of the festival when we first opened. And so uh, over time, I, as I was doing all of this work, I started hearing about this issue called fracking and I had no idea what that was about. Um, and so I heard that a movie called Gasland was going to be premiering on HBO. So I decided to watch Gasland and learn about it. And they ended up airing it back to back that first night. And I watched both airings. And in between, I ran to the kitchen to see if I could set my tap water on fire. And I couldn't. So I was happy about that. But I thought, I need to get involved in this issue. Um, and so I had heard that Josh Fox, the director of Gasland and the person who stars in it, um, I had heard that he was going to be in Bethlehem, actually, doing a talk at Lehigh University. And so I told the board at Morea, we happened to be meeting a couple nights after the premiere of Gasland. I said, you know, this movie was just on. Uh, I don't think anybody else had watched it, but some of them had heard of it. Some of them had heard of fracking. And so when I said, I thought, you know, maybe I could go invite Josh Fox to be our speaker and show his film on that Friday night. You know, does that sound like a good idea? Everybody agreed. So I went to this uh, event and I met Josh as I had hoped I would. I asked him, he agreed. Um, he sent me a copy of Gasland. It's like a copy he burned for me and scribbled Gasland on it. Uh, it's the last copy an activist was given, I'm pretty sure, because HBO was about to acquire the distribution rights for the film. And so the last you know, copy he could get out to sneak out so I would have one it was the one he was able to burn for me. So I probably have the last activist copy of that film. Um, but anyhow, uh, he, he came and did a great job for us. I still work with Josh to this day. Uh, but um, the, the group that had hosted him that night at Lehigh was Lehigh Valley Gas Truth. And so I thought, oh my gosh, there's an anti-fracking group in the Lehigh Valley, so I'll, I'll join them. And so I started going to their meetings and I started encouraging people to come with me, um, but nobody wanted to come from Berks because depending on where you are here, it's kind of a hall to get to Bethlehem. And so 
I thought, okay, so I'm just going to take the information from that organization back to Berks County and I'll start something called Berks Casters. And that was the whole idea. I didn't really have a big plan other than that. The one thing I did think was that one way or another, we were gonna become downstream of this issue, whether it was literally downstream of the contamination or down the industrial you know, stream, so to speak, of uh, you know, infrastructure build out. And that's exactly what did happen, um, but not for a while. So at first, you know, we had this group that was uh, very small. The first meeting was two people who showed up in addition to me. One of them was the progressive easing publisher who had put his uh, easing on hiatus, but decided to bring it back so I'd have a place to write about fracking. And then the other person who showed up was a local attorney. And he decided to uh, sit down with his kids the weekend after we had our meeting and come up with a design. And he told me that if I wanted it, um, I could get an artist to do a rendering that was nicer than their crude uh, drawing that they had done. And he'd give me a couple hundred bucks. I could make t-shirts, sell them, save the money, use it for our organization. And so I took him up on it. I asked a young student at Kutztown University who was involved in everything. So I knew her from a number of different activities, but she was an environmental science major with parents who are artists. And so she's a gifted artist in her own right. So I gave it to her and she came up with this design for us based on the drawing, don't crack your mother. <laughs> and so to this day, that was not just a t-shirt design, but that's our logo. Um, and so uh, we were able to make t-shirts as Bill, the attorney had uh, offered and everybody wanted one. I mean, it was amazing. It was like Filene's basement, you know, people digging through the box to find their color and their size and everything. The people just were crazy for these shirts. And what was amazing to me about it was that we went from having like two people at a meeting to having 30 or 40 people at a meeting. It was really interesting to see how much having some physical token, a membership card, or in this case, a t-shirt, how, how having something means that you belong and how important belonging to something is. And so, uh, you know, I think it's very important that we work together. I mean, we can all do things individually to make the world a better place, but I think we can make big changes if we work together and having something as simple as a t-shirt was what helped us get on the road to doing that. Um, so uh, that was just an early lesson learned. So we started with this that great group that we had doing tabling events and festivals and all sorts of things going out there and educating the public. I did more screenings of Gasland that I can even bear to think about. And I feel like a Trekkie, I could pretty much recite Gasland for you at this point. I've seen it so many times, but uh, you know, but that's what we were doing. We we're trying to educate the public about an issue that wasn't happening here. There's nothing about fracking that was affecting us here at the time. And so um, eventually we actually got a call from an organization called the Guacamole Fund um, out of California. And they started in the seventies. It was Bonnie Wright, Jackson Brown, and Crosby, Sills, and Nash that started this uh, effort to help uh, in the anti-nuke uh, fight at the time, but they stayed together and uh, Guacamole Fund now provides tables and all sorts of support to groups when those bands are touring. And so they said, would you like to table at a Bonnie Wright concert coming up in Reading? And we jumped at the chance. And that was the beginning of a very long relationship that continues to this day. Anytime uh, Bonnie Wright, uh, Jackson Brown, Crosby, Sills and Nash uh, tour in this area, we're there at their concerts. We've also done Farm Aid three times, once in Hershey, once in New York State, and once in uh, uh, Burgettstown, Pennsylvania, over in Washington County across the state, where it's all happening. That's the heart of Brackland in Pennsylvania. So we've had all these you know, amazing experiences all in the way of educating people. Um, but you know, we were still not really making a splash outside of the choir, so to speak. You know, you can talk to the choir all day long, but you need to be able to get the word out beyond that. And so I hatched a little plan because the Reading Eagle, WFMZ, Morning Call, nobody around here was really writing about fracking at the time. And so I concocted this little plan where I was going to write a press release about every single thing that happened. And so if a new study came out or if the legislature passed a bill or new regulations went into effect or some company violated the rules and had an explosion or a spill or something, I wrote a press release about it and sent it in with no expectation of the papers ever you know, printing any of this. But I thought one day they're going to want to talk about cracking and I want to be the one they call. <laughs> and so uh, it worked. One time I'm standing in the cat food aisle at Weiss Market and I get the call that Governor Corbett has decided 
to the Friday before Memorial Day, of course, you know, because they love to do bad things when nobody's paying attention. Uh, he had announced that he was going to be reopening the state forest to drilling and was going to be throwing in state parks. And did I have a comment? And I'm like, oh my God, now I have to actually have a comment. But, but you know, I got through it and I, I provided a comment and that was the beginning of, you know, starting to get some coverage on this issue in this part of the state. And it was really you know, a, a, an important moment for us, uh, but we still weren't really on the map. Uh, and so what happened was that we learned that Governor Corbett was gonna be coming to Albright College to be the commencement speaker. And we decided we needed to protest. Now that's something we hadn't done yet. We'd done lots of educational events, but we hadn't actually done a direct action. And so we agreed in one breath that we were gonna do a protest. And then in the second breath, we said, it's not gonna ruin graduation. We were gonna be respectful of the fact that this is the most important day in the lives of these students and in their you know, lives of their families who paid through the nose for this education. We're not ruining education. We're not ruining graduation, I should say. So we, uh, we were reviled for our decision to have a protest at a graduation and talk about media coverage. I never did for any other issue of work on all these years. I've never done more media interviews and things than I did for that because I was constantly being asked to come and do an interview about why we weren't canceling our plans and wouldn't we rethink it and what do we think of the college's reaction to us and, da, da, da. and i just kept saying it's our constitutional right we're going to be on the street we're not going to be on campus you know but we're going to be respectful we've agreed to that it's going to be fine but we're going to do it and so when we did it we had about 80 people show up um some of them were actually there to protest some of Corbett's education policies, actually. Um, somebody was, a couple was there holding their Medicare for All sign, but we didn't care. I mean, the more the merrier. The whole idea is we need to work together on these issues, and it's all important that we stick together and show solidarity with one another in our various fights. So we were happy to have them with us, but the majority of people were there for our protest. Um, and so we lined 13th Street that bisects the campus, and they were going to have to make a processional from the campus side across the street to get down to the field house for graduation and so uh, we did what we said we were going to do as the processional approached we put down our signs and we applauded the students and that changed everything um, six of the professors we didn't know this at the time but six of the professors in full regalia left the processional and stood with us and inside some of the students stood up and turned their backs on corporate when he started speaking and so they actually had their own protest and so it was kind of amazing. And it was the thing that turned everything around for us because not only did it put us in a good light and show that we were not kidding when we said we were gonna be respectful, but it gave us credibility. It showed that we were real and that we're serious about it, that we're not there to just make noise and disrupt and cause problems, that we are really there because we are serious, passionate people about something that matters and that matters to those students' futures. And so that got us a lot of points, in fact, um, the Associated Press picked up a photo of us and put it on the cover of the Washington Post. Uh, and so, uh, you know, so we actually got, uh, you know, some visibility out of it. But what really happened that was most important, of course, is that getting that sort of credibility, being a legitimate group, a serious group. Because in my world, I'm up against an industry that lies constantly. They lie about how many jobs they're creating. They, they lie about the science. They pay for their own studies to be done. They come up with the results that they're looking for. You know, they they constantly inflate job numbers. They minimize the amount of damage that they're doing. They're, they just lie. And so if we're gonna be taken seriously, we need to vet every single thing that we say and never ever just make stuff up and speculate. And that's in part because the other job, the other role that we have other than being credible is being the ones who can push the envelope and start the conversations that nobody wants to have. And so sometimes we do have to take, go out on a limb a little bit and say, are, are these illnesses that are occurring in Southwestern Pennsylvania the result of fracking? You know, we don't want to say that they are, but we want to raise that question and get that conversation started. And so we have to sound reasonable and that we're not just, you know, coming up with some sort of paranoid or, you know, crazy thoughts about something that we're actually basing what we're um, concerned about on science that already exists to suggest that we might be right and that it's worth looking into. So we're very, very serious about all of that. Um, but the other great thing that happened in terms of just you know getting our message out um, from this day was that from that point on, the Reading Eagle, every time a reporter came into the you know, paper to kind of pass through, there are a lot of young reporters who use 
those mid-level papers as a stopping ground for, you know, just kind of getting their feet wet, getting to know how the business works, and then they move on. So there are a lot of them that pass through the Reading Eagle. And um, and so from that point on, the, the editor said, uh, whenever they put somebody on the energy or environmental beat, they said, call this woman, Karen Jarrett, and sit down with her for a couple of hours and get her to do a brain dump on fracking. And after that, the Reading Eagle became the first paper in the state to call for a statewide moratorium on fracking. Um, after that, actually, in 2017, when Trump ascended to the White House, um, there were Burke's Progressive this and Burke's Progressive that meetings, and they would always have an environmental uh, part of the meeting, and they'd have like breakout groups for different issue areas, and I was always the breakout person for the environment. Uh, so I met the former editor of the Reading Eagle, and he said, you need to have a TV show. So he actually got me a TV show for a year on uh, the Berks Community TV network that we have locally. And he was my co-host. We called it Take a Deep Breath. He named it. And for a year, we did all sorts of shows on climate, environment, sustainability. So, you know, we've been able to get our message out many, many different ways. We have people in our group who are sort of our field representatives. One of them is wearing the mask there holding the toxic comm sign. That's Mike Shaw from Kutztown. He loves to go out into the field and you know, go to these sites when there has been an explosion or a or spill. And he's sort of our investigator. Um, we have another fellow. He's now a journalist in, in Harrisburg. But at the time, um, he was sort of a, a gonzo journalist at Kutztown University. And he was sent uh, a a picture of a coupon that was given out by Chevron when a, a well exploded in uh, Greene County and a young 26 year old man named Ian McKee was killed, one of the workers. And so to make the community feel better, Chevron went to Bobtown Pizza and bought pizza coupons and give, gave them out to everybody in the community like that was gonna make people feel better. And so somebody sent Sean, the young member of our group, uh, that that pizza coupon. So he started investigating, looking into it. And it turns out people were pretty upset about being treated that way by the company, uh, but they were not very uh, willing to speak because they're always afraid of retribution if they do say something out there. And so we took advantage of that to you know try to get the story out ourselves and not put it on them to have to tell their story. Uh, and so we started a campaign called Pizza Means Never Having to Say You're Sorry. And, um, and we had everybody um, put out a petition that went viral. And then we wrote back to everybody who signed saying, okay, now call the, the CEO's office and tell them you want to order a pizza. And we had a local group um, take a pizza box filled with petitions to the Chevron office and Green County and deliver that with a two liter soda. That was the other thing that you could get with your coupon. No substitutions, but you could get those things. Um, and so we had um, you know, people take a pizza delivery to at the Chevron office in southwestern Pennsylvania. And we actually made it onto the Daily Show. I was on CBS News. I mean, it was pretty crazy. But that's the kind of stuff that we do because some people, you know, cannot tell their stories. And we were very sensitive to the fact that, you know, we need to be the one sometimes doing the speaking when we learn about things. And so we have people in our own group who are out there making those connections and getting those, you know, bits of information that could help other people. And so uh, that's just uh, some of the things that we've done as Burke's Gas Truth. But I wanted to stop telling the history of it all to tell you about the next big development that occurred with our organization and with our movement as a whole. What you're looking at is flaring of methane. Um, and this is a photo taken by Frank Finnan of Susquehanna County. I always make the joke that I came for the water, I stayed for the climate. It's not a great joke, but it's the joke I always tell because what happened was that at the beginning when I was first involved in the issue, we were all talking about water all the time. That's what it was about, water contamination. We knew other bad things were happening. We weren't quite sure what. Uh, we didn't know what was gonna come, but what we really didn't see on our radar was what an impact methane and fracking was having on climate change. And so it was right around the time when I was getting involved that Bob uh, Howarth and Tony and Graffia up at Cornell University uh, with their research assistant, Renee Santoro, that they were putting out the first big paper on methane migration and fugitive emissions of methane. So what you're seeing here is what the industry does all the time. This is called flaring. They do something else called venting where they don't set it on fire, but they just let it into the air. That's typically how a lot of um, methane gets into the atmosphere. 
But what Howarth and Graffy were able to point out is that there is a lot of uh, leaking that occurs not only at the well pads, that was the first revelation, but at every step along the way in the production of natural gas, the pipelines, compressor stations, power plants, you know, processing plants, every step along the way, things are being leaked. Lots of methane is making it into the atmosphere. And of course, methane is a very powerful greenhouse gas. It's 86 times as powerful as carbon dioxide in what's considered to be the 20 year time scale. They're, it's really hard to compare the apples and oranges of a very short-lived greenhouse gas like methane and a very long-lived greenhouse gas like carbon dioxide. And so what the experts do is they you know, look at slices of time, basically. And in 20 years, they can see that the relative strength of uh, you know, methane to uh, carbon dioxide is 86 times, So meaning it's 86 times better at warming the atmosphere. Um, over time, it diminishes, but it doesn't matter anymore because we have less than 20 years left. So that's the only relevant time scale. And again, in that period of time, it's very, very, very powerful. And that molecule of methane that makes it into the atmosphere, as I'm speaking right now, is going to be there after we don't have time left to stop climate change. It's still going to be there. And that's why we have to stop putting the stuff into the atmosphere. And that's why I do what I do. So what I found out as, as I'm like into it for a couple of years was that I was in the climate movement. And so I never actually had to go through any sort of climate anxiety or climate despair. I was already doing it. I was doing the best work I could possibly do as me to you know mitigate the problem that we were confronting. And I think that helped me, you know, because of course I didn't have to go through all those, you know, negative emotions and those concerning emotions. Uh, I could just use this information as more ammunition to make my case. This is another reason we need to stop this. <clears throat> and so I think that's um, one of the things that I took from what um, Dr. Pfeiffer was saying, because it was interesting to me that she's a psychologist or has that background and then ended up becoming an activist, um, you know, I sort of just was already there. And so I didn't have to experience it, but I can certainly appreciate other people who do experience it that way. And I actually have a point that I didn't hear her make. I've never heard anybody really make it, so it might be complete nonsense, but I'm gonna make it for you anyhow. <laughs> this is what it is to take action on climate. You're either Al Gore or you're the Extinction Rebellion. And there's almost no, nothing in between. Now I'm exaggerating to make a point, but you're either sort of the climate ambassador who can talk to world leaders and make deals and get them to take more aggressive action, or you're the ones who say the system is broken, we are shutting it down because it doesn't work. You can take either of those positions. I love both of those positions. Al Gore actually runs something called Climate a Reality Project, and he trains thousands of people on how to go around with that PowerPoint from Inconvenient Truth and talk about it locally. I'm one of his graduates. I'm one of those people who can go do that. Um, but beyond that, that whole line in between the two ends of the you know, of the, the line there with the arrow points, you know, where Extinction Rebellion and Al Gore reside, that whole line in between is pretty much vacant. You don't fight climate change because climate change in a way isn't a thing. And what I mean by that is because you're looking at this enormous, massive problem trying to get your mind around it. And one of the reasons why it's so off-putting to people, I truly believe, is because that, that space in the middle that's not occupied by any way of fighting climate change is actually occupied by people like me and people like you know, people fighting to ban plastics and people fighting immigration and trying to protect refugees because they were going to see a refugee crisis the likes of which we have never seen because entire island nations are going to be underwater. And so if you're fighting immigration, you're doing the right thing. You're fighting a climate fight. And that's the thing. Climate change isn't the thing. It's a result of many things that have gone wrong. And so what isn't automatically apparent to people who think they need to be taking on climate action, you know, climate change issue, is that they're probably already doing it. 
if they're doing anything to make the world a better place, if they're doing organic gardening or starting a community garden or planting native plants, or if they are, you know, trying to make their communities more walkable and bikeable and healthier um, and safer for people who want to, you know, get around that way and not be emitting, you know, from driving their cars two blocks away to go to the grocery store. Uh, you know, if they're working on all those big issues, PFAS chemicals, uh, whatever it is, uh, I mean, just divestment, uh, getting banks to stop investing in fossil fuel projects, whatever your take on almost any issue is, you're you're taking climate action, like Naomi Klein. I always, you know, cite the, the name of her book about climate. This changes everything. It does. And so all those things that aren't climate action per se, that seem to be more indirectly associated, are climate action. You are actually taking action. Um, and so it's really important for people to remember that. And, and I think that might just help people find their way in. There's always a way into this issue. There's so many different things you can be doing. And it all matters. It all matters greatly. And so um, that's what I tell people who are kind of you know, off put by just how massive it is and how small they feel compared to this big problem. It's, a, it's the result of a million problems and we need to take on all of them. Um, so I, I want to give one more bit of, um, uh, or one more opinion before I show you some actions. But what I'd like to do then is just, you know, talk about anything you have on your minds, take some questions. Um, I can show you more about the organizations that I'm involved with and some of the things we're working on. But, uh, but before I get into all of that and take your questions, I thought I would just give you one last piece of advice, really, I mean, call it an opinion, but this is something I'm really urging people to do, and that is to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. For everything I just said about you finding your own way in and doing what you do best, um, at the same time, we're at the point where you really do need to, to push yourselves. And, um, and so I use as my example of this, my friend Andrea Honore uh, from Weymouth, Massachusetts, where she's part of a compressor station fight. The compressor stations are all along pipeline routes. There are jillions of them. Um, they're not necessarily considered to be the, the big fight that people get involved with, but up there because of where this compressor station is, it is the big fight. And it's a relatively small piece of infrastructure uh, compared to what you fight when you're fighting the Keystone XL pipeline or something like that. Uh, and yet this little project has got the federal government sort of turned on its head. They have managed to really change the way the federal government is having to approach the way that they approve projects like that. This little group, except Andrea will tell you 30 or 40 times that she is the most anxious person on the planet. And I'm not talking about climate anxiety, I'm talking about clinical anxiety. She's a very anxious person and yet she's doing it. She's out there doing things she would never thought she could do like television interviews, you know, public speaking, she does all of it because it's what needs to be done and she's great at it. Uh, and so I would encourage people to, to go after those things that you believe that you should be working on that matter to you, but push yourself, do more, do, do the extra thing that you don't really think is in your, you know, in your skill set, and you'll find that maybe it is like when I started with the Democrats, the Obama campaign, and never thought I could be the neighborhood team coordinator. Turns out I could be, and turns out I had some skills. So you'll surprise yourself. You'll probably feel better in the end, but you'll also make a huge impact on you know this massive problem that is a combination of problems that we are taking on at this point, and we'll need to really double down on in the years to come. Um, so with that, I wanted to tell you about a few actions and some of the things that are happening right now. So um, I had mentioned when I was talking to Susan and Dara about today that um, there's actually a, a directory in the Lehigh Valley from the Alliance for Sustainable Communities that talks about all the different organizations that exist in the Lehigh Valley and all the different ways that you can engage. So if, if you're thinking about getting involved and you're not really quite sure what direction you'd like to take, you can take a look at it online. You can download a copy of it and take a look and see what all is going on out there. We're in there, uh, but Burke's Gas Truth, I don't think Better Path is, but I'm, I think I'm in there for that and maybe a 350.org that I used to run locally. Um, so, you know, but have a look, there's lots of good things going on. Lots of great people working on every imaginable issue in this area. So take a look. 
Um, I'm asking your help with a couple of big things that are happening this week, and these are the actions I hope that you'll take. Uh, what's happening on Tuesdays, both things are happening on Tuesday, actually. The state legislature keeps trying to pass bills that would roll back the rules on conventional drillers to like 1984 standards. And one of the things that had been uh, put under moratorium by the DEP in 2018 was the road spreading of drilling waste as um, a road a dust depressant or in a road stabilizer on unpaved roads and as a de-icer and anti-icing agent on paved roads. And uh, so last year's bill, SB 790, uh, the legislature tried to roll back the rule about putting the waste on unpaved roads. And we were able to defeat that because the waste is highly toxic. It's radioactive. I mean, it's a mess. We don't want it on our roadways. And it's the one issue out of all the ones that are in that bill that most, most people react to, relate to, they've heard of in many cases. And so uh, that's the one we had zeroed in on with the letter that we did. And so now that they've brought it back this year with paved and unpaved roads in the bill, uh, and they're trying to act on it very quickly, they're moving it much more quickly than they did last time. Uh, so we're, we have now until Tuesday to get a letter into the legislature telling them vote no on this bill. Um, Daryl Metcalf, is the guy who's in charge of the Environmental Resources and Energy Committee. He's a climate denier. Um, he's pro everything bad. He's just the worst imaginable guy to have in that role at this moment in time. Uh, and so he'll be pushing it through his committee Tuesday morning at nine. If they break the rules like they have in the past, like they did with SB 790 last time, in that case, it was the Senate doing it. But what they did was they got it through committee they took it to the Appropriations Committee that afternoon, got it through Appropriations, then took it to the floor for a vote. It's supposed to have at least a day for people to breathe and to take it, you know, to consider it, to be contemplative about it, that they broke their own rules. They do it all the time. So it's very likely that if it gets through committee on Tuesday morning, they might be voting on it Tuesday afternoon. So we have to stop it now. Um, I would also beg you to not just sign our letter, you have the link there, and I think you're going to receive all of these links right after, so you don't have to worry about jotting all of this down, but I can also put them in the chat if it helps, uh, but on, a, on to, tomorrow afternoon, I'm really going to start formatting the letter, so I'm asking if you can sign that letter like today and share it with your friends and neighbors. That would be really helpful to get as many signatures as we can get. And then tomorrow, call your state representative, your house representative, and tell them that you want them to vote no, just in case it does get to the floor. Uh, so please take that action. The other one that's happening on Tuesday, a different coalition that I'm part of called the Voices Coalition. We focus on pipelines and shale gas infrastructure. Um, we're having a congressional hearing on Tuesday with uh, our our uh, champions in in the in the house, uh, Jamie Raskin and um, uh, Nanette Barragan from California, who's very involved in the environmental justice issues. Uh, so they've been our champions on these uh, reforms that we're trying to see put in place at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Uh, they're the ones who approve pipelines. They're the ones who are pretty much a rubber stamp. They're very cozy with the industry. There's a huge revolving door of people who go back and forth between the commission and government, you know, and uh, the industry. They're they're exactly the people that the industry wants to hire when they're ready to move on because they're up on all the current regulations. So it makes for a very too close relationship between government and this, um, you know, in this industry that we're up against. Uh, but there are all sorts of other things that FERC does wrong. And so we've written 10 reforms that we've been pushing for a long time. And we've gotten these uh, champions now in Congress. And so we're going to be doing a, a briefing for members of Congress. Um, we're going to have frontline community members in addition to having Raskin and Barragan speak. Uh, and we're going to be begging all day tomorrow. We've been doing this now for a week. We had a week of action, but tomorrow's the last big chance we have to make one last push to get them to come. And so we're doing call-ins and you know faxes and Twitter storms. And we've written a hundred million tweets and they're all set up as click to tweets where all you have to do is click on the tweet 
and then it pulls it up for you and then you hit tweet and it's sent. You don't have to write anything. You don't have to copy and paste anything. We've tried to make it as easy as possible for people to engage. So the link there is to the toolkit that explains all of this and provides the information about how you can call your members of Congress, which we'd love you to do. Um, again, how you can fax them for free um, in this uh, little program that's online called faxzero.com, where you can click on, I want to you know, fax my member of Congress. It opens up the box where you would typically type in their fax number. It's already there for you. You don't have to look up anything. You just you know, send them a fax because nobody owns that platform anymore. Anytime we do anything, we do faxing because nobody else is using it. And so we're the ones who get to them because that's the thing that showed up on the fax machine. They were like, oh my God, the fax machine is going off. <laughs> we didn't even remember we had a fax machine. We're the only ones there. So we love to use faxes um, and you can send them for free with all that information filled in. So it's very simple to say, please attend this hearing and all the information for how they register is in that toolkit. And then something else that's a little bit more of an entertainment and an educational event or a couple of events is um, the fact that we have an, an environmental rights amendment in Pennsylvania in our constitution. That's Article 1, Section 27. Article 1 meaning that it's a Bill of Rights level amendment. And so it's supposed to be something that is on par with due process and freedom of speech, and yet it's been ignored. <clears throat> It's still being ignored on the front end by the legislators and the people who write the regulations and the policymakers, but it's starting to be taken seriously by the courts. On May 18th, Article 1, Section 27 turns 50. And so that evening, I need to cough, excuse me. <coughs> that evening, we're going to show a never before seen interview that Maya Van Rossum did with Justice Castile. Maya Van Rossum is the Delaware Riverkeeper, and she was one of the lead, and she, her organization took the lead in a, the big lawsuit that was um, decided by Justice Castile um, when it was his last big case as Chief Justice, and he wrote the opinion that's poetic that was about Act 13, which was a rewriting of the Oil and Gas Act in Pennsylvania, and uh, it was Governor Corbett's attempt to uh, level the playing field for the industry by taking away municipal control over where things can happen in your municipality, in which you have zoning protections in place for right now, but they weren't wanted to strip municipalities of those zoning protections and just say if they want to put, you know, a well on Main Street, they can. If they want to put a pipeline through, you know, next door to the elementary school, they can. Well, you know, we fought. Um, we won, our side won, and Justice Castile made it possible by writing this unbelievable opinion. So uh, Maya is interviewing him uh, for something else that she's working on, and she said we could have her uh, video to show that night of uh, May 18th, and then the next night she's going to be our guest on a webinar series that we started when the pandemic hit called Better Pass Presents. Um, so she's going to talk about not only that, but she's going to talk about her book, The Green Amendment, and the organization that she started in addition to Delaware Riverkeeper where she works, but she's also started an organization called Green Amendments for the Generations uh, because she's actually doing this like one woman campaign going around the country, getting other states to pass environmental rights amendments. And so she's gonna be our guest. Both of these things start at 7 p.m. And those are the registration links if you wanna get on our Zoom and learn more about our amazing constitutional amendment and, um, and more about Maya and the work that she's doing. And then finally, I put some contact information for me if you wanna learn more about either Better Path or Brooks Gas Truth or contact me, uh, there's all the information you need. Uh, so with that, I thought I would stop talking <laughs> and give you a chance to ask any questions or say anything in reaction to anything that I already said. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing. I can put them in the chat if you'd like, like I said, but you're gonna receive these links right afterwards. So I need to start sharing. I have it queued up. I wanted to add if there were anything else um, that came from our Q&A that might need to be added, um, we will do so. But I can send this out to everybody who was there, who was here today. And um, I, I really do have to um, emphasize you are a force of nature, <laughs> uh, Karen. It's just amazing presentation and to know that you've done all of this in, in just 13 years. They've been a long 13 years for you, I know. And every day seems like a, you know, you, you pack 48 hours at least into 
24. Um, but reactions, questions. By the way, I should say we we were supposed to have Maya Van Rossum speak to us um, at our kickoff event uh, this past October, um, but she was in fact oh, on her way to New Mexico, I think it was, to speak yep. about the Green Amendment and instead a, a very terrific um, person from her organization spoke on water is life was our topic. And some people here may have heard, heard uh, him and I'm embarrassed because I'm forgetting his name in a second, but it's anyway. Fred. Fred, I thought it was Fred. I just couldn't remember the last name. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so questions like where would, you know, if, if we had, I mean, I'm gonna definitely listen to, to your, I'm going to sign your letter. I'm going to do whatever you've asked because we have to do that. And, you know, we have, I didn't add this um, exhortation because the people on this call um, already are familiar, um, but it's our Jewish imperative, those of us who are Jewish, you know, it's actually written in our uh, Jewish text that uh, we're not obligated to finish the work but we are, uh, neither are we uh, free to uh, disengage, to not do it, to not be involved, um, to desist from it, that's what it is. And the famous one is by Rabbi Hillel, if I am not for myself, who will be for me? But when I'm only for myself, what am I? And if not now, when? And, um, as Mary Piper says, if we don't grow our moral imagination, our ability to uh, get motivated, to use our heart, creativity, um, if we don't expand that, then we will simply um, destroy ourselves. So I don't want to be the downer, Debbie Downer, but. Um, what questions? Uh, I'll, I'll start that. Wow, you are really inspiring um, in, in everything that you've been able to do. And um, it would be great if all of us could have such a great impact on, uh, you know, our communities and the people around us. I mean, it, um, if each of us just takes that first step, sometimes that's what it takes. And I think that's what Mary Piper was talking about in her book, that um, if you bring maybe just your, you know, what, what you're good at, what your gifts are, what your interests are to the table and put it out there, um, then, um, you know, who knows who will join you. And then in joining together, that brings hope and happiness and action and, um, and health, right? Uh, mental health to you and um, hopefully health to our environment and our world. So I think that's a lot of what Mary Piper was talking about. Um, so some of the things that really hit me were your comments about um, how almost every issue is a climate issue now, and that's really become very evident um, as um, you know we realize how interconnected, which is another point that Mary Piper makes, how we're, we're all so interconnected and how we can't Somehow we've become, we've started to think about the environment as an other, um, and it's us and it, and how we really need to be thinking about uh, about it as Mother Earth, which I, I love your logo, Mother Earth, and how we're all interconnected and we're all just little parts of a bigger whole, um, and that if we don't care for each other, then we don't care for ourselves. Then you know the the Earth will, uh, you know will not get healthier. Um, I liked one little part of in the book where she talked about how um, we can all build our own small sustainable boats by you know whatever little actions might maybe we take and then that becomes part of a flotilla that works towards global change. I love that imagery um, from her, her green boat um, concept. Um, and wow, your, your flotilla is really, Great. And I, you know, I want to be part of it. I'm definitely going to sign on to all those letters and, and call my representatives, which I think I already have on, on a lot of that, but I will do it again because they don't always know if you do it twice <laughs> and um, I'll do it under a different phone number. 
And um, uh, yeah, I just think I just think that all that's um, really great. I love that we have action items to take now out of this um, event, and that people can contact your organization or others in that alliance directory uh, to find the ones that that resonate with them. Um, I wish I was as good at making slogans as you are with the pizza means never having to say you're sorry. I love that. <laughs> um, I think that that really is helpful when you have, you know, like imagery like that and good language like that. I think that's another point that it was easy for you to become a climate activist because you came into it with the simple part of water. Water was your, you know, and it's often, it is as easy as that air, water, agriculture, whatever that point is, but it's all related and exacerbated by climate change, right? So whatever we're, we're fighting. But anyway, I don't really have a question. I just thought that uh, your talk really meshed well with, um, with the book um, and uh, really enjoyed the background uh, to hear how you, how you got to where you are and made it really, uh, made, really made the point that really any of us could, could do this and have impact. And we all need to be doing this and have impact. So, well, thank you know, you. Um, thank you. I really appreciate that. And I really enjoyed, I, I watched the uh, YouTube. Um, I don't read books anymore. I have stacks of books I haven't read yet. I don't have time, but I apologize. I really <laughs> will read the book one day. <laughs> but but, um, but one of the things I wanted to say about the Better Past Coalition, um, I don't know how many people know about the history of um, the environmental justice movement, but um, it all really started in 1982 in North Carolina, Warren County, where they were fighting to stop a landfill from going in where PCBs would be disposed of. And there were fights like that going on all around the country, but generally in communities of color, you know, somebody talked about how, uh, you know, the, the poorer parts of the world will be uh, most affected. That's already happening and it's been yeah. happening for a long time. Um, and so, uh, what happened out of the environmental justice movement was that, or what happened as a result of this fight in um, Warren County, I should say, is that the people who would become the leaders of the environmental justice movement went there to be part of the fight, to stand in solidarity and help the people organize. And, um, and, and it was something magical about that one that kind of just brought them all together at a moment when, when they kind of realized that they had a movement happening. One of them who was thrown in jail said, this is environmental racism when he was being put in jail for driving too slowly. <laughs> but he knew that's why he wasn't being put in jail. So this is environmental racism, but it very quickly became environmental justice, understanding that it goes across many different kinds of communities, uh, whether they're poor white communities in rural America or whether they're indigenous communities or communities of color, uh, that it, there are these disadvantaged communities that are disproportionately affected. Um, the people who were conspicuously absent from these fights was the environmental movement. Um, a lot of the big greens, so to speak, never dealt with those kinds of issues. They dealt with saving the oceans and you know, species and all that kind of important stuff, but they didn't address communities that were fighting local fights. The people who were those people who became the leaders of that movement were people who cut their teeth in the civil rights movement, actually. And, uh, and NAACP was huge. Uh, in getting the environmental justice movement started. Um, and so one of the things that, I, I, a lot of the problems persist, I will say. And so one of the things that really struck me in all my years doing this and being involved in every imaginable network, because I actually work you know, outside of Berks County a lot. I mean, I work internationally on a lot of things. Uh, and in every single thing I've been part of, it's the environmental community. Maybe with faith leaders, we often do work with faith leaders, sometimes with groups like Physicians for Social Responsibility, uh, you know, so like public health organizations. But when we started the Better Path Coalition three years ago, our birthday was in April, um, at our very first uh, action where we uh, had a rally called uh, We Choose a Better Path, Governor Wolf. And we went up to his office to deliver a letter and it said, you know, we need to stop doing these bad things. We need to, you know, care about the climate. We need to worry about the future. Um, we immediately partnered with the Poor People's Campaign. And so we are actually on the, the coordinating committee of the Poor People's Campaign and they're a member of the Better Path Coalition. And that's the first time that we have ever. I, I've never, ever, ever been in a group that had those kind of connections before. The other group that we're very involved with is March on Harrisburg, the group that goes after government corruption. 
Um, and so it's the first time that any of the networks I've been involved with kind of break out of the environmental mold, so to speak, and start really working with all those other issue areas. And it's critically important because it is one issue. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I, I think it's, for me, it's one of the, the most exciting parts of having started Better Path is that we did something really unconventional in a number of different ways, because there was never a coalition in Pennsylvania that was statewide that was led by the grassroots and the front lines and the fence line communities and never any that partnered in the way that we have with other groups outside of the environmental community. So it's a real new thing for Pennsylvania. We're very excited about it. We've you know, gotten a lot of things done in three years and we're looking forward to what's coming next because we are starting to be able to get out and about. We just did our first in-person action at the Capitol uh, last week. And so uh, you know, we're, fighting, we're fully vaccinated. So some of us <laughs> are feeling good about getting out there again. We, it was so discombobulating to not be out there. So, so uh, yeah, so we're looking forward to what's, what's next. Yeah, we are very involved with the environment. Well, justice is really where the Tikkun Olam Committee came from, that, that focus, economic, racial, and, and environmental justice, and the, where they all interconnect. So we've actually mm -hmm. been talking about that from the beginning, and we're working with a lot of organizations in the, uh, on that, uh, from that frame. Um, including the youth climate organ uh, organizations, which are very in tune with those issues. Um, so we would love to uh, partner with you in those efforts uh, going forward also. Um, That'd be great. Very, very important for us. Um, anyone else have any questions? There's one in the chat uh, from Howard. What is your thought about fracking basically beginning under Democratic Governor Ed Rendell and now is possibly expanding under Democrat Thomas, uh, Governor Wolf. Huh. Well, I don't want to get overly political today, but uh, I think you said it at the beginning, Susan, that this isn't, uh, you know, that in fact, Dr. Piper talked about how there's no green water, or blue water and red water. And uh, at the same time, it's not um, a situation where we have champions in one party and not another. Um, now we do have individual champions, amazing people have made it to Harrisburg who weren't there before. Um, finally, and we have a handful of people who are very, very strong on the issue. Some of them who ran on these issues and got elected in Pennsylvania, which people would swear would never ever happen, but it did. Um, so we're, we're fortunate to have them, but it did start under a democratic governor. So a lot of the things that we do uh, we don't consider it to be partisan at all. You know, our problems are on both sides of the aisle or on every side of the aisle if there are any independents around, sometimes there are. But, uh, you know, it's just across the board. And so um, I consider Governor Wolf to be my white whale, frankly. I go after him more than I go after anybody else because he's such a disappointment to me. Because he, I, well, and this is something, our, one of our campaigns right now is called We Are the Ones. And what it's about is the fact that we won the uh, fracking ban on the Delaware River Basin after fighting for it for 11 years, fracking is banned in the Delaware River Basin now as of February 25th. But when they banned fracking, um, Governor Wolf actually seconded the vote. And uh, we ran into him in the cafeteria at the Capitol in August of 2017 and went up to him and said, we were just to your office to deliver a petition, um, you know, asking you to ban fracking in the Delaware. Do you support a ban? And he, without hesitation, said yes. And I'm like, Oh, okay. <laughs> and so um, we found out like a month later that the Delaware River Basin Commission had made the decision to ban fracking. They just didn't get around to it until this year, probably because I'm imagining because of the Trump administration having a seat on the commission, it was probably difficult. So they got to it as soon as he was gone, to be fair. <laughs> However, um, they based it on the science and they based it on the on the ground impacts that they were looking at in 2017. And in 2017, there were about 900 studies at the time. When fracking started in Pennsylvania under Rendell, um, it, there were six studies. There was almost no information, no peer reviewed research. And yet he let it happen without doing a single study. New York didn't make that mistake. Maryland didn't make that mistake and they both banned fracking. Um, but, you know, Rendell, you know, he's another one that I don't have a lot of respect for, but he let it happen here. And um, 
And now, you know, 2017 years go by, lots of bad things have happened. Delaware River Basin commissioners look at it and they say, uh, you know, these 900 studies are compelling and these on the ground impacts that we're seeing are compelling. And yet now that it's 2021 and the ban finally goes into effect, there are now more than 2000 studies and far more impacts. And I say all of this because Governor Wolf, at the same time that he is banning fracking here in the basin, because we can't tolerate one day of it here because it's too dangerous because what he's seen uh, in 2017, um, he's still going around the state pushing his back to work PA plan, which is a pandemic workforce recovery plan that would require uh, 20 years of a severance tax to pay for the program that he's trying to fund up front with bonds, but then that would be repaid with, uh, with a severance tax for 20 years. How can you go to those communities that have been so hammered by fracking, where people are doing so badly, where there's no resilience? That's a lot of the work that I do, I consider it to be the double whammy uh, of, of this issue that I am part of. One of the things that I was thinking about before when we were talking about uh, you know, the different ways that you can participate, even if you're not doing something that's directly or even indirectly uh, related to climate, what you're really doing, if you're helping like with the PFAS chemicals issue or something like that, you're helping make communities more resilient now. Black Lives Matter. If that's your issue, you're making communities more resilient now to deal with what's coming because bad things are coming to all those communities. And when you're fighting the fossil fuel industry, you're dealing with those communities they are being hammered right now helping them to be more resilient for the climate impacts that are coming. So you're doing both. You're trying to protect them from having worse things come, but you're also protecting them by telling, trying to make them more resilient, able to handle those things. Because the communities in Pennsylvania, I mean, we actually started doing tours of Southwestern Pennsylvania for legislators. And we called them and said, you need to go see this. You're legislating about it, but you've never seen it. Go see it because you, you are a changed person when you leave those communities after you've seen what's going on in this state. And so it bothers me very much that Governor Wolf can be talking about 20 more years for the same communities that have been hit so hard. And so we decided to write a letter to him and I started writing it and it turned out to read more like a poem. And it called, we are the ones. And we are the ones, Governor Wolf, who you never had time for. We've asked you to meet with us repeatedly. You've never had time for us. We are the ones who you looked at when you said that it was too dangerous. We are the ones who have lost loved ones. The woman, we actually made videos of it. And the woman who reads that line is Janice Blanock, whose 19-year-old son died of viewing sarcoma. Because there are a, there's a, a spike of rare cancers in southwestern Pennsylvania in those areas where fracking began. And we called on Governor Wolf. I have a long back and forth I could tell you about but with Governor Wolf and the Department of Health trying to get them to take this seriously. I'm part of a big group that's been working on this, but uh, I'm the one who got the letter back from Wolf because I'm the one who sent the facts, honestly. Um, and so he wrote back to me, um, uh, but you know, he was writing it to the group because we had said, you need to uh, you need to take this stuff seriously. You need to investigate and find out how much more widespread this problem is. Uh, the Post Gazette's the one who opened our eyes to it. They're the ones who did an investigative report, not the Department of Health. That's not how we learned about it. So anyhow, we uh, you know, so we've been going back and forth on that issue for a really long time, and um, and now we're doing this campaign. Uh, we went to the Capitol. That was the action that we did with the, the letter. We read it aloud. We had different people reading it. Uh, we delivered it to Governor Wolf. They wouldn't answer the door. We had to slide it under the door, which is really symbolic as well. And um, and basically, you know, that's that's the message that we're trying to send is that when you are making this decision in the Delaware River Basin, you're effectively calling the rest of the state a sacrifice zone, and for 20 years. And that's unacceptable. And so we're not going to tolerate that any longer. And we need this to stop. And so um, you'll be seeing lots more about that out of us because we're not, we only just got started with that one. But, you know, we do have uh, big plans to make more videos. We're asking people to record, you know, themselves reading one of the lines or something else that they come up with that they'd like to say. And uh, we actually are probably working with a documentarian. We're making the arrangements now to turn it into an actual like you know, documentary of people making these statements so that we can get some, you know, some visibility for these poor people who have suffered so badly and whose, whose harms have been ignored by the state. Um, one more question for you, Karen. How, how do you um, keep your faith and your energy and 
you know, I don't want to get all woo woo about what kind of uh, self care or whatever you do, but you know, and, and what tips would you have for any of us who really are, you know, gonna get more than our toes wet? Yeah, I don't know if I'm a good one to give advice because I think I'm a bit deranged because I wake up every day excited to do what I'm doing. And I mean, that, that line about, you know, action is the antidote to despair is for sure the truth, for sure. But I really, I truly believe we're going to solve all these things. And I, we have had big successes. We banned fracking in, the, in Pennsylvania. We banned fracking in a part of the state. We stopped pipelines. We stopped power plants. We stopped processing plants right here in my county. We, you know, I actually was one of the people who uh, got the EPA to reverse itself on a really bad statement it made about water contamination in a big report that it had done where they said there was no widespread uh, systemic impact. We got the Science Advisory Board of the EPA to do an investigation into that, to listen to people, take testimony, and they reversed, you know, the, you know, they told the EPA that they needed to take that language out of their executive summary and their press release and, and be honest about the fact that there are obvious direct impacts on people and it is widespread. If you're in a community, no, it's not the whole state, but in your community, it's everywhere. That's widespread. That's a definition of widespread as Flint, Michigan, you know? And, and so, uh, you know, so yeah, I mean, just the things that, I spoke at the Paris climate time. I mean, just, it's crazy. You know, like once you put yourself out there, it's if you build it, they will come sort of is how I think of it because I don't know anything. I'm not an environmentalist. Like I said, at the beginning, I don't, I didn't do well in science classes. <laughs> you know, I was a librarian, you know? And so I, you know, I like doing research and I like that part of it, but I had no skills and no, no, uh, you know, qualifications for sure. But you put yourself out there, you learn it, you do the work, and you can accomplish amazing things. And so I wake up every day knowing that we're going to win, and I am excited to get back to work. Well, I don't know of a awesome. note to, you know, to end on, but jean louis you have your hand up. Is that from earlier? That's you. Okay. Just want to make sure I didn't ignore that. Um, I really don't know of a better note to end on than your optimism and your energy to keep on going and your hope that and, and belief that we will win. Um, and when we join together, because we are all interconnected, um, we will win. And we've, we've seen that throughout the, we wouldn't have been here today if it were not for our four, their four parents to, who have fought off all the uh, the ills that were they that were beset on them. Um, so I can't again thank you enough. This is being recorded, and we will sooner rather than later get the recording up on what will be the new YouTube channel for Congregation Colomet, and we're going to have that on our Tikkun Olam page. And we'll send out the uh, the links also yeah. uh, right we'll away. It's right away. Yeah. Okay. Thank you a million. And I'm exhausted from uh, just trying to take it all in, but it's <laughs> thank you so uh, much. Really great. Your enthusiasm is encouraging and optimistic. You've gotten lots of thanks from everyone, and um, and we're going to keep telling people this is not political. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I in on a beautiful day like this, taking time out of your day to sit inside and listen to me. I appreciate it. I know I like the great indoors, but I know I'm not the only. You know, I'm not <laughs> typical. <in that way. laughs> the great indoors, I I love it. Um, love it. Lots of lots of quotes from you uh, today, Karen. We have a lot to uh, remember you by, and I'm sure we'll be in touch. Yeah. Um, thank you, everyone. Till we meet in person at an action somewhere soon. Yes. I can't Definitely. wait for that. <laughs> same, same. Exactly. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Be well, everybody. Take care. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Right. Wow. This, this was absolutely amazing. Just amazing. We have to get our congregation more involved. I am just pissed off that there's so few that came on. God damn it. We really have to. I got to think about how to do it. Um, but yeah, this is, this is not acceptable. Well, 
Yeah, I mean, this is. I am an enthusiastic person, and I know it, it. One just has to do a tiny little bit, you know, a tiny little Take bit. Take that first step. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I I didn't say it, yeah, you know, outright, but anybody who would like to get on our mailing list, what I try to not do is just inundate you. I can't stand those things where every time I look at my email, I have something from the same organization. I stop looking, you know, so I try not to do that. So when I send it out, there's an actual action or a really important event, like the, May, you know, the article one section 27 stuff we tell you about, you know, so, you know, you, I won't bombard you if you do get onto our mailing list. Good. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks so much, guys. Yeah. That's awesome. Awesome. We'll have a recap. Thanks, Karen. Thank you so much. Bye-bye, bye, guys. Take care. Okay. I'm going to end this, I guess. Yes, I will end this now. Thanks a million, Karen. Bye now. Take care. Thank you again, Susan. Thank you. <laughs>